Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Hallelujah. Welcome to Israel Life Wednesday Night Bible Study. I am so glad that you are here with us tonight. Um, I want to give everyone a few seconds to kind of jump online. For those of you all that are there already, you're like, uh-oh, Pastor Jeff had let that Native American back up in here. Yep. It's me. It's your boy, Minister Lee O'Brien. Praise the Lord, everyone. So uh, we're about to get into it. We're about to really get into it. How's everybody feeling? I hope that you had a blessed day. Uh, I hope you had a real good day, as a matter of fact. And uh, prayerfully, it's about to be a better night. Amen. I'm still going to give you all some time to jump in here. I see some of y'all jumping in. Hey, Charles. Who's that? Schwan, Sh Schwan Lee? All right, all right. Glad, So glad you all are watching. Oh, that was my man, Elder Doug. So glad you're here. So glad. What's up, fam? You got it. You got it. Yo, we, we about to have some fun. Y'all already know. It's the little Indian dude. He always got something, you know. But, I, you know, I'm so grateful because God is always family. Hey, Elder Ice, how are you? So glad that you're here with us tonight. Hey, for those of y'all that are jumping on, you, you might as well go ahead and start texting your friends, email them, uh, DM them, let them know. Yo, Pastor Jeff, then let the Native American out. Let them know. We, we about to get into it. We about to have some fun with the word tonight. Amen. Just going to give you a few more seconds to kind of jump out there. Hey, hey, greet one another. You know, Pastor Jeff, if we was in the house, he'd be like, hey, hug somebody. Go ahead, greet somebody while you're out there. Don't just holler at me. Holler at your Facebook family. Holler at your Israelite family. Oh, so glad. So good seeing you there. Yes, Rosemary Peterson. Good evening. All right. All right. We, we getting there. Okay, we got like 20 people on already. Man, that is good stuff. I am excited. Whoa, I'm excited about that. Okay. Okay, for anybody that know me, y'all know that this is probably one of the hardest things that I'm about to do because Pastor Jeff wanted me to come and do Wednesday night Bible study without people in front of me. And I'm telling you, that is so hard. I, you know, to be able to just speak into this camera. Maya, my niece, I'm going to need you, girl. So, but tonight... I am actually going to get into uh, some word, but, you know, before we get into the word, let's go ahead and jump into prayer. Father, we thank you for truly this is the day that you've made. Father, we shift gears. We intentionally begin to slow this thing down. Father, it's 7 o'clock in the evening for most of us. Most of us have gotten up, gone to work. We've worked out. We've dealt with kids. We've dealt with strategies and, and foes on our job. It's just been one thing after another. Then it was raining today. But God, we thank you for the rain. Thank you. Father, when it looks dark and cloudy, thank the you. one thing that clouds may be over our heads, Father, but the one thing we recognize is those clouds are beneath your feet. Thank you, Lord. And Father, because they are beneath your feet, we know that you still care for us even through stormy light weather. Thank you. So Father, we just give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. Yes, Lord. Because it is you who brought us this far. Yes, Lord. We are only here now because this was a part of your plan, your purpose for us. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we know that we have sat and we prepared. But, Daddy, I empty myself out and say, yes, Holy Lord. Spirit, have your way. I will get rid of every study and note I've ever had. I command my spiritual ears to be open to hear from your throne room and only speak what God would have me to speak. Father, I give you praise because I have the confidence of knowing that you will do that. Father, I thank you right now for every hearer of the word tonight. Father, I thank you for everyone that's about to come onto the line. Thank I thank you, Daddy, that this shall be a word that does not just challenge them, but propel them into the God-given destiny. Jesus. Father, because that's what it's all about. So it's in your name that we ask all of these things. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So like I said, we're going to have some fun. For those of y'all that's just getting on, you still texting your friends and be like, hey, y'all, that crazy Indian is out there. Yep, just, just keep on texting them and letting them know, but we're going to jump into it. Amen. Amen. I want to continue in a vein uh, that we was in on Sunday. For those of you all that joined us online, or maybe you was just in the house with us on Sunday, and I thank God if you was. I, I am so glad if you was there to join us. If not, you missed a treat. I'm telling you now, you missed a word. 
And if you did miss it, it's not too late. This is the advantages we have with modern technology. Cool. You can go back to our Facebook page. You can go to our YouTube channel and go catch it. Go to Israel Life Church. And I'm telling you, Minister Troy brought a word on Sunday where he began to talk about a crisis identity. That thing resonated in my spirit for a couple of reasons because I've been there now for a couple of months. Not me personally saying that I'm in an identity crisis, but I've been looking at the church at large. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that the church at large is indeed having an identity crisis. More specifically, I believe that the men in church are having an identity crisis. So let me start it out this way. When someone asks you who you are, how do you respond? And I pause here purposely. It is a good question. When someone asks you who you are, how do you respond? The question, who am I, is a very brief question, but yet it's very, very profound. The question as well as the answer is the core of our being. See, the question to who I am, it reveals how we identify ourselves, or more importantly, how we perceive our identity to be. The issue with identity is, is that most people struggle with trying to figure out what their identity is. So let me give it to you as an example. Think about teenagers. You know, for me, I, I have, you know, children, and I remember when they was going through those teenage years, but if you go back before their teenage years, elementary, middle school, they was pretty much the same. They go to school, they came in, they was glad, they ate, they colored, you know, they wanted to watch Disney. But boy, when they got to high school, hmm, they get to high school and they wanted to explore with different music. They wanted to explore with different clothing. They wanted to explore with different friends. You know, they come in one week, they want to do karate. The very next week, they want to do tennis. The week after that, they want to be in dance. And you're like, what is going on with you? The only thing going on with them is they're trying to establish their identity. It doesn't just stop there with our teenagers. Let's think about our young adults. They now, you know, have matriculated through high school, and now they're going off to college, and now they're trying to identify themselves through the schools in which they attend. This is why you get some of us that go to HBCU, some of us go to these specialty schools, because we are looking to identify with something that will help us get us to the place of our future uh, career ambitions. It doesn't just start with young adults. We can go to adults. Uh, normally with adults, when you begin to ask them, you know, how they identify, they normally, normally would identify with their job. So normally the question becomes, hey, who are you? Well, hey, I'm Leo. <laughs> normally the very next question is, what do you do? Because they want to identify with their job. Now, see, the dangers of that is, and this is, you know, unemployment. The dangers of being identified with your job, the minute you are unemployed, you feel as though you don't have an identity. It's been robbed from you. It's been taken from you. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I've been on this thing for a couple months now, and it's, I'm really looking at it when it comes to men. Mm -hmm. You get men that maybe don't identify with their job, but what they do is they, they identify with a sports team. Mm -hmm. They are so engrossed into <laughs> they are so engrossed into these sports teams. They put on all their Ravens regalia. They sit there in front of the TV already. They will watch all the pregame shows leading up to the game. They know all the stats. And every week, we watch the Ravens take us through ups and downs. We're not even in the playoffs no more. But, you know, we didn't had heart attacks. And, you know, of course, I'm over-exaggerating here. But we, our sugar diabetes, our high <laughs> blood pressure, everything, all over a Ravens team or all over a sports team because we are trying to establish our identity mm -hmm. through something. Mm. Now see, I'm not saying that it's not bad to have an identity because an identity helps define who we are. Not only does it define who we are, it lets others know who we are. Mm -hmm. So it's not bad to have an identity. The other thing with an identity, it allows us to prioritize those things which mean the most to us. See, whenever you know what your identity is, then you have the ability to allocate your resources to those things which will promote you and your identity. When you begin to know exactly what your identity is, you can prioritize those resources and say no to some things. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? All right, so 
What happens though when a person loses their identity? And, and let's, let's think about it for, for a moment. And as I begin to think about it and pray and I begin to ask God, like, God, how is it that we lose our identity? I mean, we start pretty much in, the, in our formative years trying to establish an identity and we get to certain things. And how is it that we lose our identity? So, and this is the thing that I got. We lose our identity when we begin to submit to things that are unstable. Or we begin to surrender to things that are outside the realm of our understanding. And, and trust me, I'm going to tie all this together for you. You may as well go ahead and keep texting people. I'm so glad to see we up to 40 people. You may as well go ahead and keep texting other people like, yo, this Native American about to say something here tonight. So whenever we begin to submit to these things that are unstable, we begin to lose our identity. But the truth of the matter is we don't lose our identity. The thing of it is we are having and identity crisis. You still have an identity. Mm -hmm. See, the thing of it was, Satan never wanted you to actually lose your identity. He just wanted you to exchange it for something else. Mm -hmm. We're we going to tie all of it together. So now I just introduce Satan. We have an enemy, mm -hmm. an adversary, the devil, if you will. He's always around trying to pervert God's intention for creation. Now, one more time. I'm, I know I'm going to slow it down for you. Satan, our enemy, our adversary, the devil is always around trying to pervert the intention of God's creation. Mm -hmm. The enemy knows what his job is, but we as the church a lot of times, we as the men of God in church fail to realize what our purpose and place is. And so we allow the identity, we allow the enemy to come in and put us in an identity crisis. So let's, let's think about it. Satan ultimately wants to get us to a place where we question God about everything. That when Satan first presented himself to Eve in the garden, he was like, did God truly say? He's getting her to question exactly what God said. Now for those of us, and none of us are uh, exempt from this, We've been through some pains. We've been through some afflictions. We've experienced some sorrow. We could probably take it back as recent as the pandemic that we're still going through. Some of us have been afflicted by it. Some of us has lost maybe some loved ones behind it. Come on. And what happens whenever you start going through pain and affliction or sorrow? Come on. The devil will provoke you to question God. Why did you allow this to happen to me? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's his intention. That's, That's right. his purpose. Yo, our enemy is doing his job. Yes. He, he know what he's doing. <laughs> so now, what is our responsibility? So the, the, the enemy's job then, if I was to simplify this, is the enemy does not want you to obtain your inheritance. Either he doesn't want you to obtain it or he's going to do whatever to get you to forfeit your inheritance. You may as well go ahead and just text in there now and say, yo, that's dope. That, that's text like that, just put, somebody please put that in there for me. That's dope. So now, scripture reference, because y'all not going to say, Pastor Jeff let that crazy Indian out there again, and he didn't give no scripture. Let's start with John 10.10. 10. It's a familiar scripture. For the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Jesus is setting a standard for us. Mm -hmm. He's telling us from the very beginning, hey, you have an enemy. And he, he describes him for us. He said, guess what he is? He's a thief. Mm -hmm. He's coming to rob you of those things that I said that you can have. And I've called you to be joint heirs. He's trying to take your inheritance. Mm -hmm. Don't let him have it. He's trying to get it through your identity. So you probably say, okay, let, let's go ahead and, and tie this thing all in. I told you earlier, say, hey, that's dope. So we're using John 10.10 10 as our base. We, we establish the fact that we have an enemy. We establish what his purpose is. So how does the devil come and try to rob us of those things? 
Well, let's go with the D, because you know me. Anybody that's saying listen with me before, you know, I'm going to give it to you in a way that's easy to remember. It's going to be alliterated. D, stop allowing the enemy to use your dysfunctions against you, against you. Just because you're dysfunctional, just because you came from a dysfunctional family, does not mean that you cannot have the inheritance that God has for you. You're like, okay, what is this man talking about? Okay, so let's go to Genesis. I want to jump over to Genesis, and we're going to look at a very familiar story because, as I told you, I'm piggybacking on what happened on Sunday. This is an, extend, an extended service yes, from Lord. Sunday, if you will. Yes, Lord. We pick it up in the story with Jacob. We already know who Jacob was. You know, he came from uh, Isaac. Isaac was his daddy. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know that Jacob had an older brother, Esau. Mm -hmm. They lived in a time where, you know, the oldest kid got the birthright. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I need to write it out the way I, I need. I want to read it the way I wrote it out for you. Mm -hmm. Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, had two children. We already went through that. Esau was a man after his father's heart. See, because Esau was from the, you know, he liked being in the woods. He was that wild child. He liked hunting. He was rough. He was all hairy and everything. Jacob, though, was quiet, more thoughtful, laid back in the cut. He stayed around the tents. You know, he stayed around the house. He helped mom and them out. You know, he, he, I, hey, Dad, I'm going to look after the flowers. You know, right. American. Yeah, that house Native American. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. He stayed around. And see, the thing of it was, though, Isaac, Dad loved uh, Esau more than he loved Jacob because he was pretty much just like him. Mm -hmm. But the word kind of shows us though how his mother, uh, Rachel, loved uh, um, Jacob hey. more. Mm -hmm. And I said, Rachel, I met Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Please forgive me, y'all. Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Rebecca loved uh, Jacob more because, you know, more close to him. Now, back during that time though, whenever uh, a dad died, the older son received twice as much as the younger of whatever the father owned. This is what was called the birthright. So it was his right as the oldest born. Now, like many of you all, you should be questioning like, but he really wasn't the oldest. Wasn't there an older brother? But we just talking about the oldest of these two, okay? All right, so we'll, we'll leave that alone. All right, so now, when Isaac, so now we're we are in Genesis 27. I'm sorry, I did not tell you all exactly where I was. So around Genesis 27, Isaac became uh, very old. He's getting up in age and he couldn't see anything. And he, one day he says to Esau, hey, my son, I'm old and I know I'm going to be, you know, departing this life here soon. But before I die, I want to give you as my oldest son the birthright. I want to pass this blessing on to you, to your descendants. I need you to go out into the field, you know, use your bow and arrow, go ahead and do some hunting, bring me some food in. You know, the kind of stuff that I, you know what I like, you know, steak, you know, we get, get what I like, cook it up the way I want it and bring it to me so that I can bless you. So now we did talk about dysfunction. And let me say this about dysfunction. Esau sold his birthright because he came in one day and he was hungry. He just gave it up. Matter of fact, I want to read that directly from, from, from the word. I want to, I want to share something with you because I want to make sure that I get this right. Let's look at Genesis 25. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm going there myself to make sure I pull it up. We're going to Genesis 25. We're going to look at verses 29 through 39. I'm going to say that again. Genesis 25. Verses 29 through 39. All right, all right. Praise the Lord. Praise God. And why am I not getting it? Okay. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open, open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why it is also called Edom. I'm reading from the NIV. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. 
Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. The enemy came in with the dysfunction. See, because we can look at some of the dysfunctions here. First of all, Esau gave up his birthright as if it didn't mean anything just because of the fact he was over-exaggerating the fact that he was famished. You weren't that hungry that you're going to go ahead and give up your birthright. But we're talking about dysfunction. This is what the enemy is doing. The enemy just wants to show you or keep painting this picture before you that your family is so dysfunctional, you're so dysfunctional, you can't ever have the inheritance that God said that you can have. So now... Esau will go ahead and give it up because he's like, what does a birthright mean to me? First of all, you got to understand Preach that it. the inheritance that God has for Preach you it. means everything to Preach you. Preach it that. means everything Preach to it. you. Preach it. Preach it. Preach it. Mm. Thank you, sir. And so let, let's look at it some more, though. Esau, I mean, now Jacob. Jacob now has to deal with his own issues or dysfunctions or whatever it is you want to call it. E Jacob knew he was tricking his brother. Why would you even begin to ask him for his birthright? Because you're dysfunctional too. You got to know the man in the mirror and begin to deal with your dysfunctions and still not let the enemy take you or rob you of your inheritance. That was the D. So what's the O? Well, the other thing that the enemy will use to rob you of your inheritance is the opinions of other people. Genesis 27, verse 5 through 15. Come on, we're going to work this Bible a little bit tonight. Oh yeah, I know you Bible scholars out there, y'all love this. It's the beginning of the year. You should be in Genesis. How many of y'all started your reading plan? You just start putting it in the chat. I just started my reading plan, and I should be in about Genesis 20 now or whatever. Yeah, you, you please be reading your Bible. Please don't just let us always minister to you and you don't pick up that word. Genesis 27, we're starting at verse 5. So what does the word of God say? Now Rebekah was listening to Isaac as he spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I may, be, may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now this is mama talking to her son Jacob. Now my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father, just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. This is really more dysfunction. Please note. Jacob said to Rebecca, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I had that silky smooth skin. They don't say silky smooth. I'll just add that in. I just want to see what y'all was going to put in the comments. Okay, got you. Somebody said they in Leviticus. Oh, yeah, okay. Praise God, Vivian Lake. She in Leviticus already with her Bible reading plan. All right, so then he says, he says to his mother, but, you know, I got this smooth skin. I'm not hairy like my brother. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. Jacob is smart enough to go, wait a minute, this might be taking it a little bit too far here. But what happened? He got caught up in the opinions of others, even though the other was his mother. His mother still had the influence and was still saying, hey, this is what I want you to do. His mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. You cannot let anyone Mama, daddy, brother, sister, I don't care who they are, distract you. The enemy will use, look at it, he was using his mother mm. to try to get him to deceive his father out of a blessing. My Lord. The devil will use whatever it takes. Mm. So when the dysfunction wasn't happening, now he's moving to the opinions of the other people. Mm. And his mother's like, it don't even make a difference. Whatever, you just do it, whatever it is, I'll take the curse on me mm. if he decides to curse you. Mm. Really? You gonna lay down? Okay. We we gonna see how far that really really goes. Mm. So, say that's dope. That's dope. That's dope. So what's the P? Hmm. And this is where it's gonna get hard. Don't lose nobody yet. 
the P, the devil will use the pulpit to rob you of your inheritance. Mm. Yep, it got a little, it got tight. It get tight. Mm. Mm. Okay, so maybe, maybe we don't have to go as far to say a pulpit. So let's say a platform. Mm. You know, those people who we look up to, those people who we regard as further along in the faith than we are, those people that's been around, they are seasoned, if you will, you know, and they're supposed to be leading and teaching and guiding us. And so we come to them and we begin to confess things to them. Mm -hmm. You say, hey, man, I, I got this weakness. You know, I slipped up here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're really supposed to be praying with you and leading you and kind of getting you there. But what happens is they begin to put a label on you. So now I come to you confessing my faults, especially when it comes as men. This is why it's hard to keep men in the church, but I praise God that we got a shepherd and Pastor Jeff who's so big on making sure that men are there and we are growing more and more men in the house of God and I'm so happy about it. I'm elated about it. And this is why I wanna make sure you get this word. You can't let the pulpit or the platform of other people uh, allow them to label you based off of what they think that they're hearing God say. That, you know, they sitting around talking about, well, I've been praying for you, and, and this is what I hear. And I remember when you prayed with me, uh, and you told me that, you know, you was having this weakness. You know, you, you're just going to be addicted to porn for a long time. And, no. Mm. People sometimes put labels on you because they, they themselves are hurt. Mm. Give you an example. Mm. Let's look at Rachel. We fast forward uh, a little bit uh, with her. When she was giving uh, birth to... Uh, when she was giving birth to Benjamin. The Bible says that as she was doing this, I, switch, I switched pages, I switched pages. So uh, as she was giving birth, her maidservant had said to her, hey, um, it, it's about time for you to go ahead and give birth. And she was like, she was almost dying. And the maidservant said to her, but you're giving birth to another son. And she was like, okay. And as she was dying, she named, named him Ben-Onai. Mm -hmm. Ben-Onai means son of my sorrow, mm -hmm. son of my pain, son of my grief, son of my travailing. So here it is, we letting dead people or dying people name us something that we was probably going to carry on for the rest of our lives. This is why you can't go ahead and accept every label that somebody's putting on you just because of the fact that they tell you I'm here or, you know, they try to make you feel inferior. Mm -mm, don't accept it. And this is why when Jacob finally got to his son and he was like, hey, here's your son, Ben Onai. He was like, Ben Onai? Not so. His name is Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Stop allowing hurt people to name mm. you. One of the things that Minister Troy said on Sunday, and I, you know, we've heard many other preachers say it, hurt people hurt people. That's right. And if we keep going to these people who we think, you know, because they got a lead on them, you know, elder this, minister this, prophet this, prophet of this. Come, come on, y'all, stop. We, we got to stop being a body that's always just willing to throw stones. When do we just wrap our arms around them and love them? And see, but this is exactly what the enemy wants. The enemy is trying to rob you of your inheritance. And so he will use whatever it takes to make sure that you don't walk into your inheritance. I'm just asking us to be careful, to be mindful about what it is that we're doing. So now let's go ahead and fast forward through this thing. Thank you. So now, what is the E? So we didn't been through dysfunction. We didn't been through the opinions of others, the platform. The E, the devil will use our experiences to keep us away from our inheritance. Let's examine Jacob's life. Jacob has now went into to get the birthright. So he goes in and you know, his mother prepares his food and he takes it into his father. He brings it into the tent. And he says, here I am, father. Isaac said, who are you, my son? Mm. 
He said, yeah, Jacob, I'm Esau. I'm your oldest son. I've done as you told me to do. Now sit up and eat this dinner I made for you. Mm -hmm. Isaac said, how is it that you found it so quickly? And he was like, oh, no, you know, God showed me exactly what the good stuff was. I went and got it and did it. Esau was like, uh, well, no, Esau was out in the field. Father is sitting there like, wait a minute. You, you don't sound like Esau. You sure? Come here, come close. Mother had already dressed him, put the fur and everything on him. So, it, so he, he tricked his father. He really did. So if we really look at it, Jacob told a lie to his father. He says, just like I told you, this is what it is. So then the father went in, blessed him. He said, may God give you the dew of heaven. May the richness of the earth and the plenty of grain and wine. Nations are going to bow down to you and people will become your servants. You'll be the master over your brother. So he went in and proclaimed all these blessings. And as soon as Jacob had received the blessings, he rose up and hurried up and got up out of there. And wasn't too much longer before he was gone. Esau comes in looking for the blessing. Mm -hmm. So now Jacob's experiences, he didn't lie to his father. Mm -hmm. Because he lied to his father, he had to hurry up and leave his home because now Esau is so mad, Esau wants to kill him. Mm -hmm. Got to leave. Because he's leaving in such a hurry, he winds up in the wilderness, didn't really pack the right way he was supposed to, falls to sleep, and has to use a rock as a pillow. Jesus. That, this is how you know he was, he was in a hurry. But see, this is so significant because something happened when he falls asleep on this rock. It was there that he had a vision of angels ascending and descending. It, he said it was like a ladder. Jacob's ladder is what they call it. it. It's angels going up, angels going down. And most of us read the Bible and don't realize how that is very significant. Because if we think about Jacob, we always say Jacob was the trickster or he was the cunning one, the one that kind of had some wisdom with him. It is not ironic. You, you know, we always hear you can't read the Bible, but you got to read the Bible. That was a very significant moment. So now these angels are ascending and descending and you say, well, what's the significance of it? Because our word tells us in Hebrews 1 and 14 that angels are sent to those that's about to inherit salvation. Jesus. Come on. Mm, come on. So now, gets up from that, moves on, winds up getting into his mother's countryside, hooks up with his uncle Laban. That's a whole 20 years of experience. Yeah. You know, you work seven years, think you're going to get this one chick. Find out that ain't her. He makes you work another seven years for the other one. Now you there. You got two wives. Yo, whole nother level of stress. But then he winds up working another six years because he's like, yo, I, I want you know wages. That's you know I should have gotten. So we talking about twenty years passes. Now think about it. The enemy is trying to rob you of your inheritance. You didn't just now wasted another twenty years working for somebody because the enemy just got you out there distracted doing whatever. But what happens with that? After 20 years, he now has to leave his uncle's place because of more scandal. What happens? His uncle's sons come and say, hey, Jacob is growing rich. I mean, he, he taking all of our father's stuff. So it's like now his cousins, because that's who they are, that, you know, his uncle's kids, his cousins, his cousins like, wait a minute, this man gave me take our birthright because he's taking everything our father had. There's going to be nothing here for us. Now, Jacob has to leave again. The, your experiences, the devil will keep you running on this doggone treadmill. And because of all of your experiences, all the while robbing you of your inheritance, all the while distracting you from actually walking into the promises that God has for you. Don't let him do it. So now what happens? Jacob now, and, and see, we didn't go on through Genesis 29, 31. So, so now Jacob is now at a place where he's getting prepared to meet his brother Esau. And this is the place where we know now where he comes and wrestles with the man of God. Okay, let's really slow it down. 
The Bible says that when he was going there to meet, he was at the ford of Jabbok. Mm -hmm. J-A-B-B-O-K. I actually, you know, I, I read it and read it. I never took the time to look it up. Do you know what Jabbok means? It means to empty out. Mm. Until you surrender everything to God. Until you empty out of everything, all these experiences, all your dysfunctions, all the opinions of somebody else, all the labels that other people have put on you, you're not going to get to the full blessing of God. Jesus. I'm telling you. So he gets here. So now let's go back to the angels. Some, by, some, some uh, translation said that he wrestled with an angel. Some translations say he wrestled with God. Now, if he wrestled with an angel, and I'm not going to get into that. But it makes sense to me, though, because this is why he fell asleep on a rock and was able to see the place where angels was ascending and descending. He already has experience with angels. So seeing an angel really didn't take him by surprise. Although the words say he was left alone, but we, that Minister Troy told us, we never left alone. God is right there with us. The other thing that Minister Troy shared with us, and I was like, this is good. You, Jacob has experience in wrestling. This boy might as well have been in the WWE. Because the word of God tells us that him and his brother wrestled while they was in the mother's womb. Mm -hmm. He'd been wrestling his whole life. Mm -hmm. the, the thing with God is, God wasn't wrestling you. God wasn't wrestling Jacob. All he was doing was holding Jacob. Mm -hmm. You imagine what it's like to fight with something all night long that's really not fighting you back. All they're doing is holding you. And it's just like Minister Troy was saying. Because when he was done, he touched him. And completely disjointed him. Letting him know, I could have whipped you anytime I wanted to. All I was doing, hold you. I'm letting you empty out of all of you. You got to get to the end of you. Now, see, when we talk about that's dope, you got to stop letting the devil come in and rob you of your inheritance. Because that's the only thing that he wants to do. These angels were there to ready him for his identity. Because that's what it's all about. Whenever we have a revelatory experience, it's because God is trying to make us aware of our earthly life and how it has a spiritual meaning. See, we live our earthly life, but we have so much spiritual meanings. And when we stop allowing the devil to come in and begin to rob us and steal us or stop us from trying to get to our inheritance, we can begin to walk into purpose. You know, I'm, I'm so glad because of the fact I get an opportunity to pray. Can I share this? I get an opportunity to pray with Minister Troy. And um, man, we started this thing now. It's probably been about a month. We pray every day, 8.30 in the morning. And even while we was praying one day uh, this week or maybe last week, that was this week, it was this week. One of the things we was talking about, so when you talk about you want to defeat the enemy or you want to begin to get into your identity. So if we recognize what the, what the devil is doing, you know, he's using your dysfunctions, opinions, and the platform and your experiences to rob you of your, of your inheritance. What is it that you should be doing? You need to stop thinking that you got to be perfect in order to get into your inheritance. We was praying the other day and it came out that it is your persistence over perfection that will lead you into your God-given purpose. But you won't get it until you slow down and have some patience. Mm -hmm. See, because most of us keep wrestling with God at our books where we're supposed to be empty and out, only trying to wrestle with God to get our maximum potential. We're not asking God for our God-given purpose. This is why God changed his name. He gave him an identity after he was finished wrestling with him. He said, you're no longer Jacob, but you are Israel. I need you to come on Israel Life Church. I need you all to let that thing. You're no longer Jacob. You are Israel Life Church. You have an identity now. I'm trying to take you somewhere. Yes, you still got your wisdom. Yes, you're still cunning, but it's not for evil. So if you really want to get there, we're going to go ahead and say, you know what, God? I will always seek you out. Speak to the enemy like he is. He's your defeated foe. Yes. Jesus has already beat him. Wow. I, I mean, 
We have got to understand what our identity is and walk in it boldly and not be ashamed of it. I mean, not be, I'm not telling you to be some religious zealot, but I'm telling you to love God with everything you got. I'm asking you, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you, I'm imploring. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm saying, don't let nothing rob you of your identity. I mean, we've got to get to a point. And for, uh, for a lot of us, we need to love each other so that we can get them to that place where we can love them through. And I, I hope you was blessed by that. I was really done, Pastor. Pa Pastor wanted me to keep going. I was done. <laughs> Look, the church, I, I, you know, has to do a better job. I want to see us walk into our identity. I want to see us really grow to our full potential. God has so much in store yes, yes. for us. But all we got to do is yield. We got to get to our brook and just go ahead and empty out. We begin to talk about what surrendering is. See, and a lot of times we don't like that word surrender is because of the fact that we say we only surrender to an enemy. But God, it, he loves us. He's not our enemy. He wants you to empty out and get to us to that place where he can bless us and give us our full inheritance. Man, stop settling for the partial. Stop settling for, hey, give me a little bit now. No, God wants to give it all to us. You, me, the full body. We can begin to eradicate a lot of this dismay that's going on in our city if we will identify with who we are. And you say, who are we? I'll tell you exactly who we are. We're children of the Most High God. We are above and not beneath. We're lenders to the world and not borrowers. We are everything that God has called us to be. We are victorious in everything. We win in everything that we do. We are never defeated. Jesus. We will be. We are. And we need to start saying it now. You know, even, and, and I would say this, because, you know, one of my struggles is I did not want to do a teaching like this because I'm like, I can't talk to a camera. That this is ludicrous to me, but I'm sitting here and I'm doing it. Sweating and everything. Y'all said it get hot in here. Hot in here. <laughs> but let me tell you something. My identity is I'm a man of God. My identity is I am a pastor. My identity is I am supposed to lead men. That's my identity. Now, my I was in an identity crisis because of the fact I didn't want to do it. Let's be real. I did not want to do it. So on Monday when I got the call, I was like, hey, you're going to do this? I was like, yeah, let's just do this and get it over with. And I'm telling you, I feel relieved because when you begin to walk into purpose, you begin to understand that what God has for you is so much better than what you thought. What God has for you is so much better than what you could ever could have imagined. What God has in store for you can only happen when you surrender all. When you go ahead and let it go, when you just give him your outstretched arms and you say, I empty out of everything that's in me. And I say, God, yes, you give God your ultimate. Uh, yes. Challenge God and see when he do something for you. I, I'm telling you, I believe it. I know it. God loves you. I love you. Israel Life Church loves you. And I just want us to go forth. Matter of fact, I want you all to do something for me this week. I want you to start, you know, just writing down, jotting down exactly what your identity is. If your identity is not where you want it to be right now, challenge yourself to get there. Give yourself 30 days to begin to walk into your true identity for what God has called you to be. I promise you, you will feel so much better about it. God loves you. I do too. I hope you was blessed by that word tonight. I am so glad to be here with you all. Now, come on. We know we can't just, just close out that word and not do anything with it. Amen. Go ahead. Just, just throw some claps out there, something. Give God some praise. And at the same time, we want to go ahead and prepare our hearts to give. Those of you all that's been with us for a while, you probably know it better than me, but you can text to give at 84321. I say that again. It's also going to be in the uh, comments section for you in the chats. You can text to give to Israel Life Church at 84321. God is so excited when you give. Uh, you know, this is one of the ways where we get to 
bless God. This is one of the ways where we get a chance to, uh, God says, test me and see, won't I open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there won't be room enough to receive. Man, I, I always get excited when it comes time to give. Amen. Come on, go ahead and give, go ahead and give. While you're giving, I also want to remind you, I know that there's a women's event that's coming up this week. I believe that's January 27th. Uh, this is this Friday. Please, uh, you know, if you have not already gone online and registered, please go online and register. Do that. Man, come on, support your church. Man, it, it's not more, it's more than just supporting your church. Come and be blessed. Come with an expectation that God is going to meet you there, that he's going to do something for you there. Come on, do it because of the fact you're trying to get your identity back. Praise Come on now. Praise um, while we're waiting, we're also, okay, uh, if anybody got any questions, you can go ahead and throw them in the chat. I got some, man, I'm so glad there was some people in this uh, room tonight with me because I'm telling you, I couldn't have done it if it was just me and this camera. Hey, so, look, no, while we're waiting, we got someone in here with us that can go ahead and read through the questions and prayerfully, you know, we're going to get an answer. Let's make sure we give them some hard questions, y'all, tonight. <laughs> Praise the Lord, since he's done such an amazing job. Uh, I got a question for you, and we and we have a full house in tonight. Um, what what could you tell someone who loves God, and perhaps they're watching online, or they they've been visiting church, but they are timid of joining Israel Life Church or any church to that uh, matter because of some type of trauma or church hurt or some type of abandonment or whatever they may feel like maybe God they feel God abandoned them or whatever what could you say anything to them um, regarding uh, giving them confidence in um, being a part of a fellowship in Christ is there anything you can talk to uh, if somebody is you know wrestling with joining a church or joining a fellowship that is a great question, Pastor. Thank you for the question. For those that may be struggling with joining a fellowship, joining a church, getting close to ministry, getting close to men of God, the number one thing I would say to you is this. You had an inkling that you wanted to do it. You're hanging around for a reason. You have to trust the God that is leading you. You have to trust the God that has brought you to that point where you're even beginning to question it. So the first thing that must happen, you have to make sure that you have a relationship with God. So when you have that relationship with God, there's a hearing, there's a knowing that happens inside your heart that you know that God won't lead you astray. You know that God won't leave you out there empty. God will never leave you in, uh, uh, in a no man's land yes. without some type of leadership. Yes. That's, that's not the God we serve. He is our father. He's our daddy yes. who loves us. Yes, sir. So relationship then with God, yes, so sir. your spiritual relationship with God this way, yes, sir. he's going to pour something into you. He's going to give you that inkling like you know. You, you already know. You can feel the pull, the tug, yes, and everything sir. else. So a prayer life will get you to the point where now this can become this. Thank you, Lord. Trust God in the process. Thank you, Lord. Be real with the man in the mirror. You know, that, that is my whole ministry. Anybody that knows me, I'm, you got to know the man in the mirror. Be real with that man in the mirror. Look that man in the mirror in the eye and be like, hey, why are you holding back? Because mm -hmm. sometimes it's you. I, we give a lot of credit to the devil, but sometimes it's not the devil. Sometimes it's us. It, it's, it's our own inner inhibitions that slow us down from going ahead and proceeding to that next that next step, taking that next step. Get you out of the way, period. I, it's, it's like I said tonight, I don't want to do Wednesday night Bible studies. With, I, I've always told people, you don't want me one-on-one. -on -one. I'm too raw one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> I, I might crush you one-on-one. -on -one. The best way to get me is put a microphone in my hand and, and put me in a crowded room. That's the best way to get me. I, I don't see nobody after that because I'm definitely going to empty out because I'm so humble. I'm like, man, God, you got people that really want to come here. And I realize you're not, they're not coming to hear me. Thank you, Lord. So Thank you, Lord. 
when you get real with the man in the mirror, you know that God is never going to hurt you. So even though you may have been through church hurt, you may have experienced some of these pains. Get past yourself. Jesus, talk to us. Press. You, you got to press beyond. Like we said, persistence is over perfection. God ain't asking you to be per perfect. Keep pressing. Be persistent. Amen. Is there another question that popped up? All right, we we, we getting the question together. Yeah, you know. Yep. Yeah. All right. How did you learn to walk through your process well as God was revealing your life? How did I learn to walk through my process? Woo! That's a loaded question. That's a loaded talk question. To us, talk to us. Talk okay. We don't get the opportunity. To you, you know, um, and and and, and um, you know, let me say this. I thank God for my wife. Uh, you know, my wife who covers me in prayer, who gives me the space to be able to just spend time alone, away from her at times, just to get into the word. I'm one of those ones that's up early in the morning. But all of that came at a price. And, you know, and, and I acknowledge her now at this at this juncture because she used to always uh, say to me, man, I want God to be able to talk to me the way he speaks to you. Like, it, like you be getting some nuggets. And I'm like, no, babe, you really don't want this because you don't know what I had to pay to get this. And I was like, and you have to keep in mind, why does God talk to me? Because I'm so hard headed. He knows he don't. I'm going to be out there. I'm, I'm that hula. Like, <laughs> Yo, I, mean, I, I, I look, y'all heard Pastor Jeff say when he was going over, you know, things to be a member at Israel Life, Experience. member transparency. Okay, this is about to be as transparent as you're going to get. Amen. I'm that Native American. <laughs> I'm that neighbor. That neighbor. <laughs> if I can find a way, yo, let, let me tell you something. I wrote a paper when I was in college and um, on... Uh, you know, the, the paper was supposed about supposed to be about students who cheat. And I wrote a paper pro cheat. I was like, they absolutely should. Why shouldn't we? I got to compete with every other nation out here now. I may, this country was built off of deceit. They robbed everybody. The train companies was doing all type of stuff, destroying one another. I'm that neighbor. I, I'm telling you. That's me. So when I tell you, so how do you get through the process? God had to break me. Thank you, Lord. Man. And when I tell you break, so let, let, me, let me share a story. Let me go back a little bit then since we got a little bit of time. We only got a little bit of time. Seven minutes to be precise. Okay. I can remember a time, and, and like I said, you got to understand, though, when people say, I want what you have, but you don't know what I paid to get here. When I say that God sometimes has to really speak to me a lot because if he don't, I'll be that one that just is out there somewhere, just doing whatever. Mm -hmm. And I can remember a, a, a point in my life, a juncture where man, I, I'm trying to do everything right. I got my secret sin going on, but I'm trying to do everything right. I'm in church on Sundays and I'm a hellion Monday through Saturday. Yeah, you talking real. And um, man, we would have, you know, different guest ministers and preachers come and prophets and they would call me up and I, you know I'm getting called up and I'm like man what am I get called up for and speaking words into my life and I'm like look I ain't trying to hear that and I got to a point where I was like okay God so if you want to keep talking to me because I keep coming to your house we we can make this work I stay out of your house and you stay out of mine mm -hmm. and now and that was my stance so I stopped going to church not a good place to be out there and, and be a nomad That's right. because being real with the man in the mirror, it wasn't something because the devil done it. It's because I didn't want to. Found myself in a place, I call it Egypt. I was in a place of Egypt where I was looking at 110 years there. Jesus. So you talk about how do I get through my process? Because I've been broken. I know what it was like. See, because whenever you are that type of person that no matter what happens, like you that cat with nine lives, 
you always laying on your feet. Mm. I mean, you get some scratches out of it, but no matter what, I still come out on top. You begin to think that you are that person. Oh my Lord. God had to show me how, no, no, Native American, I'm there with you. <laughs> I'm the one carrying you <laughs> through all this. I keep giving you some scratch and bumps, hoping you learn a lesson. Mm -hmm. So how do you get through a process? Sometimes you got to go through. And, and I mean go through. Damn. Now, I went through a period, though, where it was crazy. Because even in my Egypt experience, I had other religions come and talk about, hey, can we come to your church service? <laughs> I don't care. It's like, we're going to wear our bow tie. What do I care? You can look good, too. Come on. Because the process, I, you just got to get through it. Thank you, Jesus. I can remember, though, it, during that experience, my, um, my first time. See, normally, you know, you got churches that come in and preach. And you there, I was uh, whatever they call it, something chaplain or something. I don't even remember what they call it. And they was like, well, you know, the only thing is, though, if the church doesn't show up, then you're going to have to get up and preach. And I'm like, okay, but churches always show up. One time, the church didn't show up. Chapman comes like, hey, you know you're going to have to go preach. I'm like, okay. I'm up there preaching, and I'm room full of men, and it's all men. And God spoke to me and said, son, you told me you would never do this. Wow. Yo. So now I'm in that environment. Now, I, I couldn't even preach no more. I was done. I turned around and was just bawling, crying. I'm telling you, you don't want God to get you to that point where he breaks you that bad. So if you want to get through the process, just keep going through. Amen. Just don't be hard-headed. You don't have to be that stubborn. Thank you, Jesus. And, you know, like I said, that's dope. Beginning to identify some of those dysfunctions that I was going through. And, you know, and, and my dysfunction was not being transparent with the men of God around me. Jesus. See, I wasn't telling nobody that I had a secret sin that I was that's gambling nice. like crazy. See, nobody didn't know that I lost 10 grand in one month during March Madness. And now I'm out here in these streets doing whatever to make up this money. Oh, because I can't let my family know. They don't know neither. Yeah, no, you don't want to be in that predicament mm -hmm. where you find yourself up in the alley and park heist rolling dice and then you get robbed. Now you got to go down in your neck, pull out your badge and be like, yo, you don't want to do that because I'm a cop. Now, you've been out there rolling dice with these dudes for months and nobody never knew. So you want to talk about go through a process? I'm that neighbor. I'm, I'm that neighbor. You don't want to go through that. Deep I, I'm telling you, when, you, when I say, to, I, you know, I, I say this a lot to my family. Just do what I'm telling you to do. It'll make your life better. I'm not saying it out of a place of arrogance. I'm saying it out of a place of experience. You don't have to experience everything I experience. Man, God is so sweet in how he loves us. Man, he's such a caring God. Even when you think back to the story of Jacob, man, he just holds Jacob. Imagine, you just hold Jacob and let Jacob wrestle with himself all night long until he finally gives up. Man, it's the tenderness of God. That's, man, that's all he wants. He wants to love you into your inheritance. Thank you, Lord. Let him love you into it. Stop, stop wrestling. Stop fighting. Walk through the process. Was there any other questions out there? Nope. Come on. Father, we thank you. Thank you. Man. We thank you for this word. We thank you for the people of God. We thank you for your children. Father, I thank you that you have begun to show us how the enemy comes up and shows up and wants to rob us of our inheritance. And Father, as a man of God, I begin to speak to this network and to Israel life and to everyone else that's maybe not even a part of this. Our inheritance, we will walk into it. We will walk into it because we're going to surrender ourselves and submit and give up everything. We empty out of everything, God, because we want to walk into our inheritance. Father, I thank you for those people that are struggling with their identity, that you will begin to reveal to them exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Father, stop letting us fight you for potential and begin to show us purpose. Father, keep loving us through that. Father, I thank you for how you're changing the lives of your children. Thank you, Lord. And you are actually opening a door for our inheritance. Amen. You said you'd go away and prepare a place for us, Father. But now the angels are readying us to receive our inheritance. And we receive it now. We don't have to wait for the by and by. 
We can receive it now. We thank you for it. Satan, we serve you. Notice that you are defeated. You will no longer rob or steal, kill, and destroy the things that God has for us. We believe the word that Christ, our God, has come to give us life and give it to us to the full. Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus. Amen.